Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this Harassa's opening plenary session, Rebuilding Trust, where we are going to be discussing the U.S.'s conflicts and crises of our time. And I can tell you that particularly in the last eight years or so, I find more and more people asking me about America's role in the world, about the way in which America engages globally. And I remember one person talking to me about what he referred to as the long goodbye, but with, by which he really meant this kind of protracted but undeniable sort of pulling back of the U.S. with regards to its traditional role as the world's great superpower, the world's top policeman, the world's great hegemon. And, and this is something I've heard like echoed over and over again, talking to people over the past years. It's been particularly marked, of course, during the Trump administration. Um, I've heard a lot of anxiety expressed during that time, not just by America's allies, interestingly enough, but even by its adversaries, because there's a strong perception that it has a ripple destabilizing effect across the world if the U.S. is struggling with turmoil at home, if it's focused in words and is not as engaged with the outside world. We've heard from President Biden that he intends to restore America's place in the world, that he wants to recommit to the traditional ideals and alliances that really have underpinned Western democracy. But there's no two ways about it. There are real challenges ahead. COVID-19 is still shaking the globe, changing our world in ways that, frankly, we haven't really fully understood yet and been able to get our arms around. Social and political divisions are at a critical point in the U.S. There is a huge amount of geopolitical instability. You have an environmental and ecological crisis. You have problems of wealth inequality. So the questions become, how can the U.S. administration rebuild trust in its country's institutions? And how can the U.S. provide leadership in a fractured world? And obviously, these are some really big questions to tackle, but we're very lucky today because we have some exceptionally distinguished panelists to really have this conversation with. And so um, without further ado, let me introduce uh, the real stars of this session. Uh, we're very honored to be joined by President Armin Sarkisian, who has Sarkisian, forgive me, who served as the president of Armenia since 2018. He previously also served as the prime minister of that country. Before that, he was also the longest-serving ambassador to the UK. But in addition, uh, in addition to this sort of extraordinary career in politics and public service. He is also coming at this conversation with the perspective of a physicist and a computer scientist, which I think is a much needed perspective in this day and age. We're also joined uh, from the US by Megan Smith, who previously served as the third ever chief technology officer of the United States, the first ever woman chief technology officer and assistant to the president under President Barack Obama. Currently, she is the CEO of Shift7, which works to solve systemic, social, environmental, and economic problems. This is really kind of getting to the nub of some of the issues that I've just uh, touched upon. And in addition to being one of the most well-respected American engineers and technologists, Ms. Smith is also uh, serving on the board of MIT, which is obviously one of the most venerable academic institutions in the U.S. She was a member of the USAID Advisory Committee on Voluntary Aid and also a co-founder of the Malala Foundation. So we're very grateful to have her with us and to be able to get her perspective. And last but certainly not least, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California, who represents California's 13th district. And due to the challenges of trying to coordinate this session across many time zones all over the world, it's now the middle of the night in California. So Congresswoman Lee has very kindly shared some comments with us uh, because she can't actually be here. And I hope that those comments will then sort of kickstart the conversation. So without further ado, let's listen to Congresswoman Barbara Lee's opening remarks. Take a listen. Hello. 
I am Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I proudly represent California's beautiful 13th Congressional District, which includes Oakland and Berkeley, California. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. Your work is so critical to creating a more innovative, inclusive future. I'd like to acknowledge the other participants in this panel, President Gangab of Namibia, President Sarkis Iyan of Armenia, and Ms. Clarissa Ward from CNN. Thank you so much for being here. We are truly facing unprecedented challenges here in the United States and around the world as we continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. People of color in America, that's black and brown communities, we are especially bearing most of the brunt of this pandemic. There is a legacy of systemic racism in our public health system to blame. And I am working with my colleagues in Congress each and every single day to address it and to dismantle it. Racial equity is an issue that knows no borders. We are globally interconnected. And fighting inequality here in America means we are fighting in equality and inequities everywhere. America has an opportunity to lead by example. I'm working in Congress to establish a truth racial healing and transformation commission in the United States to begin addressing the centuries of racism that has plagued the black community stemming from the middle passage with the first enslaved Africans arriving on the shores in America unwillingly brought here, brought to America from the continent of Africa, enslaved. I'm also working hard to ensure that vulnerable communities are receiving the vaccine equitably in America and also around the globe. As chair of the House of Representatives Committee that funds our non-military foreign operations I have made it a priority to assist an equitable global vaccine distribution because it's not enough to be safe at home. In order to return to normalcy, we must ensure that our neighbors across the globe are healthy and safe as well. America's role should be one of great example. This challenging time is giving us an opportunity to set a path forward. Following the last four years with the previous administration, there is so much work to do to rebuild trust around the world. As we've seen recently in the January attack on our capital, democracy, it, it can be fragile. The pillars on which it stands must be strengthened and remain protected. I'm confident we will set back on a path that makes us a leader in liberty, equality, and opportunity. I'm so thankful for your invitation to speak with you all today, and I look forward to continuing our partnership in building a better world. Thank you again. And thank you very much to Congresswoman Barbara Lee for sharing those comments with us. Mr. President, listening to the Congresswoman's comments, she talked a lot about this idea of America leading by example. What does that look like to you or what should that look like in your mind from the international perspective? I think let, let me start with uh, with a small re remark that first of all, if America wants to lead even by example, America has to realize that now the new administration in the United States and with President Biden, they're entering completely different world. A world that is very much different from that one that was 30 years ago. And if we if we remember the, the famous book of Francis Fayama when he said that this was the end of the history, I was one of those who said who disagreed with him. But now I agree with the concept that it was the end of the classical world. The world that was there during the whole 20th century with its uh, uh, the way that people were exercising democracy, the way that the people were exercising elections, or the way they were exercising uh, politics and power, that is wrong. This is a new world, and this is a new world not because of the COVID. COVID in this new world is a consequence 
of the changed world because everything is much more faster. I think we travel very fast. There is a huge crowd going all over the world. So, so you get one uh, COVID patient, let's say, somewhere in Malaysia or China, the next one will be in Argentina, not in the next door. So the world has changed. And the world has changed because uh, we are speaking about the world where even the values of democracy staying as values, the way you exercise them should be different. Because this is a world that every and each politician is facing his own valuation by those who elected him daily or hourly because there is a Facebook, there is internet. And whatever you say, you get the reaction immediately. So this is something that is like daily re-election. So you have to be responsible whatever you say or decisions that you make, not once in five years. They elect you when you come back in five years, you get another mandate. No, this is a new, new world. And half of our lives is real and material, and half of our lives is virtual. So we live in a virtual world. In many cases, virtual world is manipulated by fake news, by those who have the power of, of controlling media, or controlling the Facebook, or know how to do that. So in many ways, I think the world we live, half of our time is now in virtual world, not in realistic world. Well, I'm trying to resist because I, I was one of the early users of computers and being a computer scientist or, or a physicist who was using computers. Uh, now I'm trying to be uh, very, very conservative there because I do realize how effective and also dangerous can be the virtual world. And putting, inserting in your mind ideas that don't exist in reality and controlling the masses of people into political decisions. Well, it's not a secret. Look how many revolutions were run by Facebook, by the usage of Facebook. In my own country, I'm facing, we're facing a big difficulty after the war that was, uh, that was uh, uh, imposed on the people of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic of Artsakh, which is an Armenian uh, republic, or England, or former Azerbaijan, Soviet Azerbaijan, by Azerbaijan and Turkey supporting them. As a result of that, uh, 44 days of the war, a, a part of, uh, of Artsakh or nagorno karabakh was lost to Azerbaijan by, by the people uh, and the Republic of Artsakh. But it has created uh, also a crisis inside Armenia and inside Armenians as well. And that war has taken, 44 days have taken as many young lives, I mean, people who were killed during the war, young, mostly boys, and, and uh, the number of killed is more or less equal to the number that we have lost during the COVID, which is one and a half or more than one and a half years. So it's a big disaster. And when you look at the crisis, which is economic, political, uh, a crisis of your identity, and as a president, I have to deal with that. And one of my biggest problems is, is that I have to deal with reality, crisis of economy, after war crisis, crisis of uh, psychology of people, depression, and many other things, and of course COVID, and on the other side, artificial problems which are created by fake news and manipulation and all of that stuff. So the world has become different. And if you are speaking about the role of the United States, which in many cases during the several years, we, we didn't see them, for example, during the 44 days of, of the war in, in and around the nagorno karabakh Artsakh, we didn't see much. We were heard from the United States, from the State Department, we heard from the, the President Trump, but if everybody understood that America was going through elections and we couldn't expect huge support or at, at least a pressure. A pressure on a member of NATO, and US is a leading member of, United, of, of NATO, while Turkey being a member of NATO was openly engaged in this country. So leadership. You have to accept many new things before starting leaving the world. They have to accept that environmental issues have become so 
important and so sort of dangerous and crucial the U.S. has to live there as well in many places. The issues related to, to how do you exercise a democracy? I think we're not very far from the, from the, from the world where virtual world, virtual elections will be overwhelmingly bigger than, uh, bigger than the real world. So trust is the right word. So your, your title about building or rebuilding trust is important. But you have to rebuild trust in a completely different world. I don't agree that COVID is changing the world. The world has been changed. That's why we have COVID. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, COVID was a big reaching from, let's say, Far East to Europe in, I don't know, 30 years now. And it would become a completely different disease. 300 years ago, it would have never reached Europe. There were pandemics coming and going. Now it reaches in three days, tomorrow in three hours, because of the speed of the, of the flight. So we are living in a new world, and US is, the new administration has is going to be trying to build trust to the United States in a completely different world. In a world where China has, has not much bigger economically and also militarily, and because the United States have their own contribution now by basically transferring a lot of technology, a lot of factories to China during all of these years, and so on and so forth. Europe is different. You have the Brexit there, I think. But basic values, starting about the values of freedom, freedom of expression, human, uh, humanitarian values, everything is in place. But the way you handle them or exercise them is going to be different. Things, different how you exercise democracy during how you exercise freedom. I mean, freedom of press doesn't mean freedom that anybody writes about anyone, whatever they like, because this is what is happening. And there are no rules, there are no boundaries, and this virtual anarchy, in some sense, which is the media and the media, it's, and it's not about. It's not about managing the news. What CNN is a, used to be a news agency, but nobody watches now CNN to get the news because you can get that earlier than even CNN. CNN best on course. But this is you're looking for more about analysis, comparison rather than just the news. You get news from your television, from those who are present there at that moment. So I think this is a completely different world. And there are no rules managing the virtual world. And that's why it's so easy to accuse others, individuals, companies, organizations, even states interfering into your internal, internal life or elections. Because this virtual world is so complex and complicated. So basically, it is possible to do that. And if it's possible, why not? Why, why somebody will not have the temptation of doing that? And it's going to become more and more complex. The United States, new administration, is entering this third Biden and the present Biden is team. They're entering a completely different world than it was even when he was vice president with Obama. It's a completely different world. So rebuilding trust on supporting the states like Armenia on ecology or institutions of democracy. For example, Armenia needs a balanced constitution, which is not there. Or Armenia needs support in ecological issues. Or in a further development of new technologies in Armenia. Armenia is a country of very high standards and level of education that we inherited from Soviet Union. We continue having that. Because cooperation with leading U.S. companies. Why not? Why Chinese, why, why American companies were we're basically uh, working with a lot of a lot of uh, countries. Why not with Armenia? And Armenia is a country that cannot be by uh, be basically announcing that our greatest richness or wealth is oil or gas. Our greatest wealth is the is the uh, is people. It's a small republic, around three million, three million. But it's a big nation. There are four or five times more Armenians living abroad. Even in California, 
I mean, the, the Congress lady, where she comes from, there are a lot of Armenians that live there. Only in Los Angeles, there are around a million of them, and in California, much more. And so on and so forth, in the United States, everywhere. There are, it's not, there are as many Armenians living in Russia as in Armenia. A million of them lives in France. So that's a wealth. If you know how to manage it, that's a wealth. If you develop your, your richness, that's a wealth. If you can just basically... And another thing, uh, uh, humanitarian or human wealth is, first of all, education. 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 And basically giving the freedom to those who are there ability or opportunity to express. And it's not easier than to manage a natural resource as well. It's even much more complex and complicated. So that you really need the state. In many ways that you need some freedoms. In many ways you need democratic institutions and so on. And this is in a new world which is not the classical one. I have a word for that. I call this new world quantum world. Wonder World. Quantum. Oh, quantum. Quantum, <laughs> quantum physics. Yes. Where okay. individual, individual behavior of, of a particle, in this case of an individual, politician, journalist, or a scientist, you cannot predict the classical, in classical physics, you can just basically do the, the track how the, the particle moves from point A to point B. In quantum, you have just a probability what this individual can do because this is a new world. I mean, that individual, be that the politician, the decision can be absolutely non classical. And that's why, as I said, an unknown guy, a journalist, or, or, or just a, a leader of an NGO, comes at three, four months, uh, wins the elections. Would you imagine this happening 50 years ago? Of course not. Mm -hmm. But it's happening now. And it's going to be better or worse tomorrow. So we are entering a new world. And the challenge for Mr. Biden and his team is not only build the trust, but build the trust in a new way. Because if you try to build the trust in a classical way, this quantum world will not listen to you. Because the world is already moving to absolutely quantum behavior and quantum democracy and quantum freedom and quantum technology, as I said. Because of what's happening, because the world is quantum, the first person that has the virus in somewhere in Far East of Australia reaches the other end of the world in a day or two. The classical right. world that was not really possible. No. So what I... a new world, and I think I hope that the administration in, in Washington will have the scientific and the new technology base to lead and to build the trust that we are speaking in this new world. Well, I can't think of a, a of a more perfect way to lead into Megan Smith because you know you've you've raised so many important issues here and and lots more that I want to discuss. But I think it's so interesting what you're saying about you know the new quantum world and the virtual world and all the ways in which that can be harnessed for things that are damaging our society, whether it's polarization on social media, whether it's misinformation, disinformation, fake news. And so, Ms. Smith, I want to get a feel from you as to ways in which the power of tech can be harnessed positively, um, but specifically in the sense of the U.S., the U.S.'s role in the world and the U.S. leadership in the world and in the tech field. Thanks. Um, Mr. President, I really appreciate your remarks, and I especially resonate with your point about people. Um, and also, this is a similar point that our Congresswoman is making, right? And that really the greatest strength of all of us is the sharing and connections that we have and how we can lift the talent of everyone. Um, I think that uh, a lot of times, um, you know, in the past, we've had tremendous imbalance. Um, when I was a child, we talked about environment. The river was on fire. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, Great Lakes were dying. And all around the world, we had environmental crisis, right? And we continued to move into climate challenges. <clears throat> the thing is, uh, you know, sort of what do we do with that? And this morning I thought, you know, because of the time difference, you know, we weren't able to all be on together. And I thought the sun is rising all around the planet. And I, I, rem I found this uh, small piece, which is an undersea cable. And why do I bring this? Because it has an optical fiber. 
And so as a fellow technologist and all of us, we're connected by the speed of light. And that's a new thing. Of course, the world in the past has been interconnected, but not at this rate. And one of the changes that's happening is, as you mentioned, Mr. President, as, uh, as a congresswoman shared, many more voices are coming to the table. And sometimes I think a little bit about, uh, I always wish we could rename the Department of Labor to the Department of Labor and Talent and how we would think about managing talent in, in our countries and managing bias and, and shifting away from this. One of my favorite things that's happening that we were able to do, you know, during, with President Obama is his, his notion of community organizing, which is where he originally came from, and this idea of bringing everyone to the table. And very specifically in the case of me, I had no intention to go to government. It, it hadn't occurred to me that that was a career track. I was busy in Silicon Valley. We, we worked on the beginning of smartphones. You know, now the, the chips and boards are smaller, but when they were big in, in early days and I worked with the, the team that built the Macintosh with Steve Jobs and we were mentored, this idea of apprenticeship for learning and, and learning by doing. And I came from that track, but President Obama saw that there wasn't enough of a technical community across all of government. And he didn't mean, you know, if we look at the United States, NASA or the Department of Energy or, or the d defense teams or uh, these others, and he didn't mean the IT team. Of course, we have extraordinary technical people leading across government. But he meant kind of in the policy room. And so similar to when we're working on medical things, we have a Surgeon General or we have a CDC leader or other medical teammates if, we're, if there's lawyers or operators. But there was a missing chair in our government at the highest level. Um, we had science advising, but we didn't have like that disruptive techie, you know, that was doing these kinds of things, who was sitting in the room looking at the architecture of the policy. And so his thought of a chief data scientist, a chief technical officer, and sometimes we have a real problem. If I go to Silicon Valley, the engineers lead, and the comms and policy people below, which is bad. And we see ethical issues with some of the behaviors of which features are prioritized, like Facebook. I know many engineers at Facebook who tried to focus on anti-bullying, misinformation, these things, but the senior leadership is not green lighting those as the most important features right now. We have to work on the financial features, whatever. But if we can create more balance and the technical things can be used for any topic, so I love your point of quantum um, because this idea that, um, you know, Malala, when I worked with her, she's amazing. And we knew that once we knew she would be well, that she could lead us like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, Malala can lead us. And so we supported her to have the Malala Fund and her favorite subject in high school is physics. Today, there's an immigrant from Pakistan um, who has come to MIT and she's leading, she's the Dean of Science, and she worked on the Gravity Waves team, Nirgis uh, Mahala Velva, if I say her name right. So this equality before, in the past, one group got to do all the science and technology, one group got to be the Apollo mission, at least we thought so. You know, in the early days, I share this picture. Can you see the rockets? This is Apollo launch. There's a protest. This is the same group as the March on Washington, Ralph Abernathy, who worked with Dr. Martin Luther King, saying, and we are excited to go to the moon. We also don't know why, if we can work on going to the moon, why can't we fix poverty? And they brought a mule train to the Apollo 11 launch. This year, we've added some balance. Today, I'm in DC and the NASA headquarters is named for Mary Jackson who was the first black woman engineer at NASA. Uh, and so our headquarters were lifting the hidden figures. So we know many people worked on these problems together. And how that re relates to the subject we're talking about is, how do we use this new time, as you say, Mr. President, we're in a new space and we have these technologies to be connected to really empower all of us in our own countries, in our cities, not a smart city, but a wise community, a smart, wise city. And we lift everyone and we really hear the voices. I would share maybe two more things before we get into the discussion. Um, one is a, a data set which shows, um, this is speaking in movies. Do you see the blue and the red? 
The blue is men's lines for the movies, 2000 movies, and the red is women. We have a real imbalance. Who gets to speak at the meeting? Who gets to be known in history? And we're doing it in our media, teaching our children to act like this. So I would say for quantum, I'm going to share from history Ada Lovelace. You're like, what is Megan doing? So this is the first person, the first human to invent an algorithm. And her work was done during the time of Darwin in the first industrial age. But we bring Darwin forward, who told us our history, but we forgot a revolution. Why is it industrial? Why isn't it industrial, environmental, community, social, inclusive revolution? And we always had it from the beginning. You know, people were doing this uh, in the first and the second and the third, trying to be included. Jane Addams in the second industrial revolution, maybe no one ever heard of her, but she won the Nobel Peace Prize for inventing social work in Chicago during the very difficult industrial age with child labor and other things, same problems. But we didn't bring her forward. So we don't realize that the data science and the technology that she used so beautifully in the days for smart, wise city of Chicago, data science for a wise community. In 1880s, Chicago, the woman who just won the Pulitzer Prize last year from her work more than 100 years ago on data and justice and journalism. So we have to remember to know the future can include all of us because it always did. And everybody was innovating. And if we can stay with your vision, Mr. President of the people, then I think that's the answer. And it was the biggest work that we did with President Obama, and it continues and on into the administrations of how do we use these technologies to solve problems, not just for smart driving cars, but for foster care and lunch. Why do we know where every Amazon package is and we do not know where the Boko Haram girls have been taken? We can use science and technology for our hardest problems. In fact, those are the hardest problems. And we can include each other. So I'm really honored to be here with all of you. I'm hopeful. But remember that collective genius can also be collective destruction, as we know, and that we really have to prioritize these hard problems. And the number one thing is people and the inclusion that we can have. So thank you very much for bringing me. I look forward to our conversation. Um, you know, you raised so many uh, important points there. And and particularly, I sort of, you're picking up on some of the same themes that not only that we heard from Mr. President, but also from the Congresswoman who talked about this idea of inclusion and innovation. And I wanted to ask you, Mr. President, you know, you've made it very clear that the U.S. is going to have to find a new way to lead in a new world. Do you view innovation and inclusion as being sort of part of the the secret to that or a, a recipe for a positive future in that sense? Yeah. Yes, I do. And I would like to also to answer your question and reflect uh, what was said just previously. First of all, on, on having the Ministry or Department of Labor and Talent. And then I would have gone for education and talent because the, the, the whole idea of education is not only educate people to give some knowledge and to teach them some skills, but I think the way I see it, the whole educational process, be that at school or at home or at life, is to find the talent. I mean, I, I, I would like to take, to take you back early 1950s, 60s, 70s. There were two superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union. The United States had a lot of new technology, huge industry. But Soviet Union managed to, to compete with the United States in many aspects without having that sort of equality or the size of industry that, that the United States. But what Soviet Union was doing a bit better than America was on the educational side. And you know why? Because of ideology. Because that Soviet Union wanted to have the best physicists and mathematicians keep uh, basically competing with the United States. They wanted to have the best sports uh, women and sports men in order to compete with America at the Olympics. So it was quite narrow. They, the Soviet Union wanted to have the best violin players, and Soviet violin players were better than American. 
but it was focused on competing in America. But the system was, was the right one because they were trying to find, find the talent in mathematics, violin playing, and sports anywhere in former Soviet Union to the stipend was, that was equal to the, to the salary of associate professor. And they were encouraging children. So I think educational system should be also not only educating but finding a talent. Every child has a talent. Talent of making a, a furniture, a talent of singing, a talent of mathematics, a talent of chemistry, a talent of being sports person, or a talent of doing. China, then you will be successful. So that's why, reflecting what you said, I'm dreaming that in my own country, there'll be Ministry of Education and Talent. Basically, not only educating, but finding talent for every child. Now about, you also spoke, and this is connected to the question that you, you were asking. This is about technology in the United States. Are they going to do it? I think I don't agree that we are in the fourth industrial revolution. I think I have a different notation for that. I call it our evolution. So because the processes are so quick and rapid, because we're in a quantum world, so it's going to be very difficult to say that we're in the fourth industrial revolution, that there's a fifth one and the sixth and seventh, because the evolution goes so fast. So it's a rapid evolution that brings you to our evolution, which is a revolution. So we live in a times of revolutions. And this is something that I've spoken and written many times. And that's very important to realize. Because if, if you are speaking about, about uh, fourth industrial revolution, fifth industrial, so you are speaking, okay, there's a phase transition up, and then we go, 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 there's another sixth one, then up, and we go, no. It's going to be like curve going up all the time. And that means that we have to be ready to the changing world every day. It changes every day. Tomorrow is going to be a new one. There's going to be new technology, new way of approach. And if you want to be a living country, a leader like the United States with all of this technology, you have to realize that you are living in not in the fourth industrial revolution. And that revolution is not about industry. I agree with you. This revolution is about, is about our lives. It's industrial revolution, technology revolution, healthcare revolution, and revolution in in negative way. COVID is a revolution, an anti-revolution. So everything is a revolution or our revolution, rapid evolution in all our aspects. The way we teach children, the way they learn. Our children are uh, our my grandchildren are basically the products of our our revolution. They are much more faster. They, no much more than even I knew when I was the same age. So it's a globally, it's not industrial revolution. It's a revolution of our lives. Even negative revolution is how we damage the nature. I mean, the speed that we damage the nature is horrendous. Now, how can you be successful, be that a, a small state or a big state? I think there is no difference. I even had the idea, I still have the idea, of creating a worldwide club of small and smart and successful states. And what does this mean? And that means what is, according to, to me, it's a smart and successful. It's not about how much money you have. It's not how, how much is, uh, is your country is producing per capita. It is how much you are basically focused towards future. Maybe you don't have much today. But if you are focused to the future, then you will get there. And there are examples of that. And if there are examples of states in, in, in Africa that are started focusing on in developing internet connectivity and uh, e-government, and now they are far ahead of them. So I think being smart and smartly successful is the key for a small mm -hmm. nation and a big nation. Mm -hmm. the United States, if the United States wants to lead, even a small country like Armenia, and to be a partner, a leading partner to America, America has to act the same way, smartly successful. 
showing technology to me and the new ways where to go. To making America much more advanced and technologically and knowing, having no, the know-how, how to handle 21st century, the new quantum world. So that would be the smart. And everybody would like, everybody would like to follow you. I mean that why people wanted to follow after the Second World War America because of the industrial and other successes of the United States. But success today is not only industrial, it's much more wider. So about how you handle freedom, how you handle human rights, how you handle freedom and the rights of ladies and so on and so forth. So you have to be smartly successful. Smart. No, these are very, very wise words. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we're very sadly running out of time, but I just wanted to, I guess, finish up by getting some thoughts from you, Ms. Smith, uh, you know, sort of tying together some of the themes that, that we've discussed today and, and looking at this idea of this, of this brave new world, of this quantum world, of this constant series of evolution and revolution and change. I think a lot of people can feel a little bit overwhelmed by it, but do you see technology as being the sort of the way for the way forward to, to sort of embrace uh, the challenges that are presented by this world? And, you know, you mentioned AI briefly, that's something that frightens a lot of people as well. Again, we only have a few minutes left, but I just wonder if you could touch on the, the potential of that, not in a frightening way, but in an inspiring way. Yeah, AI in a bad <clears throat> AI in a bad form. We should be afraid of, and we should work together to include everyone. Anyone who is human uh, should be welcome in the AI conversation. Not just some uh, young men, uh, young white men from uh, Silicon Valley or young Asian men from China or other places. Like it's all of us. We are all welcome. I welcome them, and I also welcome everyone. Um, and and I think I love the Hawaiian perspective. They often say, "Why don't we have aloha?" which means welcome intelligence, you know, and we can have that if we think about it that way. Um, Mr. President, I shared um, a couple of things in the chat about how the cabinet minister uh, for education in Sierra Leone has shifted from literacy and numeracy to five C's, comprehension, computational thinking, critical thinking, creativity, and civics. This is the agenda for the talent of the youth. And I share this image of President Obama with these young kids who are doing robotics to make something helpful for others a page turning robot, they're in kindergarten and first grade and he asked them, how'd you do it? They said, we had a brainstorming and then we made <laughs> prototypes. We made prototypes. What if everyone got the confidence? So back to that dauntingness that you bring up, how do we welcome everyone with their talent to practice that and become who they can be? And how do we think about the courage, the bravery and the courage that it takes to include your talent and feel that confidence and welcome each other. We have a lot of stuff to do. We need the surface area of all of us. And uh, you know, I just share a picture of Grace, who's in 10th grade. He's here teaching the police chief of New Orleans how to because we're working on justice to get the solutions. So all around the world, there are innovation communities. The neighbors need to welcome each other into them. We do a solution summit with the United Nations where we already ask who is already fixing the sustainable development goals and we get a gender balance, race balance, balance of talented people working on gender equality and climate and in fact there's one person in the first one who's an indigenous as an indigenous leader, Beno Juarez from the Amazon, who's building fabrication and advanced manufacturing capabilities on boats so that the talented people in the Amazon who live there could have a lab just like someone at MIT or in Armenia and they could invent solutions for COVID vaccines together with us and not be separated. And we could really take care of the Amazon with jobs that are about innovation and the future and inclusion and not cutting down the tree, right? So this is a, a great hopeful possibility of including each other and really thinking smartly about the bias in the data sets and the algorithms that is currently happening that will accelerate I agree with you about the rapid evolution. I just want it to be evolution of environmental solutions, ecosystems, remembering our past more accurately, including native and indigenous perspectives about nature-based solutions and ecosystems all around the world and getting the talent there in our, in our new ministries of labor and talent, our ministries of education and talent. 
and the way we team together in the world. So thank you so much for the conversation. I have to say, I feel so heartened to kind of end on a note like that, because so often with these panels, it's, it, it can feel there's a lot of doom and gloom and uh, cynicism. And it, I think it's so interesting that this conversation started out as being a conversation about U.S.'s global leadership. And it's really turned into a conversation about the power of technology.